Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to our second evening in this series of more than human encounters, which we call the Fungi Paradigm. Um, the program, program of tonight was set up uh, by me and Olav and Dubanje, uh, who unfortunately is ill and uh, couldn't make it to the Kai Studios uh, this evening. But uh, when Olava and I um, prepared the program of this evening, um, we, re we realized, in fact, that fungi, like fungi must be the most underappreciated kingdom of the natural world. Uh, without fungi, I don't know if you know that, neither plants nor animals, including humans, would have existed. Fungi were one of the first life forms on land, and they helped to develop uh, plants from these tiny little things that lived along the water into the tall trees and the forests as we know them uh, today. So from helping plants to colonizing, uh, to colonize planet Earth, uh, to treating diseases in humans, I think there isn't very much that a fungi cannot do, as the speakers of tonight will also show you. But let us first move towards the first speaker of the evening, um, Merlin Sheldrake. Uh, Merlin is a biologist and a, and a writer with a background in plant sciences, microbiology, ecology, and the history and philosophy of science. Uh, he received a PhD in tropical ecology from Cambridge University for his work on underground fungal networks. Um, in tropical forests in Panama, and he's also a research um, associate at the Freie uh, Universiteit of Amsterdam. Merlin's research uh, ranges from fungal biology to the history of Amazonian ethnobotany, to the relationship between sound and form and resonance systems. I was also told, uh, and I read in his book, that he's a keen brewer and the fermenter, and that he's really fascinated by the relationships between humans and more than human uh, uh, organisms. Um, normally, I would have switched to a live interview with uh, Merlin Sheldrake uh, and Olav and Duvange, but unfortunately, go, uh, and unfortunately, as the saying goes, when bad luck begins, it doesn't come in sprinkles, but in showers. So it's not only Olava who's not present tonight. Um, a few weeks after uh, Merlin confirmed his uh, presence, um, his agent called us that there was like a minor misunderstanding because um, Merlin at this moment is somewhere in a transnational flight. So he couldn't... Um, join us in, um, in a live video call, and that's why, uh, with the help of Jorgos Patsis from the VUB, I'm very grateful for that, uh, we prepared an interview uh, with Olave and uh, Merlin that we will share with you now. Hello, Merlin. Welcome, Hi. welcome. Uh, there is a lot I want to discuss with you, a lot, but we probably won't have enough time to do all of that. We only have about 20 minutes. Um, I thought it would be, it would make sense to start with a little bit of terminology. Um, only thing I really know is mushroom, but there is a whole, to have an intelligent conversation about fungi, it involves a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of uh, terminology definitions. So could you help us with that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, fungi. What are fungi and what are mushrooms? Perhaps that connects mm -hmm. with one another. So fungi is the name for, a uh, fungi is the plural of fungus. Okay. Uh, a fungi is a kingdom of life. So that's as broad a category as animals or plants. And um, there are lots of ways to be a fungus, just as there are lots of ways to be an animal and lots of ways to be a plant. Uh, mushrooms are the reproductive structures produced by some types of fungi. And not all types, a small minority of fungi produce mushrooms. Uh, and they're analogous to fruits on a plant. Um, they're the ways that fungi are able to disperse their spores. And mm. spores are rather like seeds on a plant. They are a, a, a propagule, a, a little particle of fungal life that can go elsewhere and turn into a new fungus. 
Okay. And so most fungi don't live most of their lives as mushrooms. Um, most fungi live most of their lives as mycelium. Mm -hmm. And mycelium is the name given to branching, fusing networks of tubular cells, which is how fungi feed. They, they grow into their food. They put their bodies into the food rather than uh, put food into their bodies as, as we do. Uh, and mycelial networks are made up of fungal cells, and these tubular cells are called hyphae. Okay. Uh, and so the hyphae tangle together, branch and fuse together into mycelial networks. Okay, and then there's the last term that I think is really interesting, is mycorrhizal. Am I pronouncing that right? That's right, mycorrhizal. And this is a name of a lifestyle of some types of fungi which live with plants, and they grow in and around plant roots, and they emanate out into the soil um, and they exist in trading relationships with plants. And the word mycorrhizal, it means root fungus, myco fungus and rhiza at root. Now, one of the things that I found really interesting uh, reading your book and sort of researching towards this uh, conversation was that mushrooms themselves are indeed the fruit, but only a very small visible part of the fungi as such. Uh, can you explain a little bit, like how many, how much fungi is there actually on Earth? If mushrooms aren't necessarily an indication of fungi, um, like how much of fungi exist? So the best, well, re recent estimates suggest there could be as many as six million species of fungi, mm -hmm. um, which means that only six, seven percent of the fungal kingdom have been described by humans, okay. which leaves over ninety percent of of fungal life. Uh, unknown to us. And so, obviously, this is a good way to summarize our ignorance about the fungal world. <laughs> yeah. And what, one of the things I always found interesting is what these partitions, these sort of categories of kingdoms, right? So you have animal kingdom, you have the plant kingdom. And I'm kind of interested in why, what makes, what makes a kingdom a kingdom, I guess? And also, what makes fungi a separate kingdom than, say, the plant kingdom? So the kingdom is just a level of hierarchical um, organization in the modern scientific system of taxonomy. And there are a number of other levels, and the kingdom is just a level, uh, a quite a high up level, a high level um, at which organisms are, uh, are divided. Um, fungi are different from animals and plants in a few ways. Um, fungi, plants photosynthesize, they have a green color uh, and they, they make their energy from light and carbon dioxide in the air. Fungi don't do this. Um, they're more like animals. They have to find food ready-made mm. and then digest it. But they are, um, they are uh, one of the things that characterizes them is they produce, um, they grow from their, they, they grow in a certain way uh, from their tip. They elongate from their tip if they're mycelial fungi and they build their cell walls out of a tough compound called chitin, uh, which is characteristic of all fungi. Um, so they are, eukaryotes in the sense that they um, are um, like animals and plants, they're mm. eukaryotes. They have cellular subdivision, like yeah. we do, like plants do. Um, they are heterotrophic, okay. like animals, okay. and unlike plants, which means they have, to, they have to find their energy in the world and then eat it, uh, and they produce chitin. Um, they build their cell walls out of chitin. Okay. Okay, that, 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 I'm hoping everybody now understands what fungi are. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I, I commend you at the, the sheer um, incredible ability to explain very complex terms in very accessible ways. So thank you for that. Um, but one thing I'm a little bit sort of been wondering, and I think a lot of people are kind of, uh, um, there's this idea now that uh, we're coming to a complete reappreciation of what fungi are and do in the world for life as such. Um, I've heard, and maybe you can correct me on this, I've heard that literally life would not have been possible without fungi. That's a new kind of concept of realization. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. What did we so, think before? Mm. And what have we learned? And what do we, what do we suspect now? So I should, should add that there have been you know, many gifted fungal researchers over the years, over the decades and, and even centuries, and many of whom have known uh, and understood quite how important fungi are to the living world. Uh, and what we're seeing now is a, um, 
more of this, this understanding leaking into a popular consciousness. Um, but for many people who have been thinking about this and who've been fascinated and impressed by fungi, uh, much of this is not news. Um, but it's a, it's a welcome change that this is starting to, the fungi are starting to be acknowledged and appreciated and um, people are taking an interest in them. Mm. Um, but they, there are new things we're finding out about fungi. You know, fungi are, are, are neglected by, by, by modern scientists, uh, have been for a, for a while. And um, so there are new discoveries about fungi and what fungi do that are, are broadening, deepening and expanding, expanding our understanding of um, of the living world. Mm -hmm. And one of these examples, one example of this, there are quite a few, but one I find very compelling is the idea that the ancestors of plants, uh, these algae which existed in fresh water and lakes and rivers, um, they had to partner with fungi in order to start making their way onto land. Mm. So the, an the ancestors of plants would have been little puddles of photosynthetic tissue. And when they started washing up on the soggy shores uh, of these bodies of water, they would have needed to um, start exploring the soil for their nutrients rather than just absorbing it from the broth that they were floating in. And to, to explore the soil is a whole new kind of um, challenge which requires new abilities. Fungi are brilliant at that kind of exploration. And so it seems that at this early stage, about 500 million years ago, fungi started to grow in and around this algal tissue and behaved as their root systems mm -hmm. um, for tens of millions of years until plants could evolve their own roots. So really roots follow fungi into being. And the entire lineage of land plants uh, within which we live and within which we um, are embedded and, and without which we couldn't have evolved, the whole lineage of land plants is a story of fungal collaboration and fungal relationships. And that what we call plants are fungi that have evolved to farm algae and algae that have evolved to farm fungi. Mm. Um, and so just this, um, this kind of understanding really changes, I think, a lot of the way that we think about uh, the world in which we live. And, 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 and soil. There's a, whole, there's a whole thing about how fungi make soil possible. Right from stone to soil, does that is that a correct? Uh, could you yeah. explain that a little bit? The science behind that. <laughs> so yeah, so soil comes about from a number of um, for, from from you know, a number of different directions. Um, but one way that 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 one a key process in the formation of soil is the digestion of of rock, um, mm. the mineralization of rock, and fungi play important roles in doing this. They're able to um, produce acids and um, chemicals that bind to minerals. And they um, they can essentially eat rock, at least a number of them can. And so this brings this mineral matter from rocks over into the metabolic cycles of the living. Uh, lichens do this, these symbiotic organisms, um, which are part fungus, but also other fungi do it. And I've seen these amazing images where uh, fungi have been allowed to grow onto the surface of some mineral like apatite. And you can see the grooves that they've etched as they've grown across this surface. Mm. So. Fungi bring across these minerals into the um, into organic cycles, but they also play a key role in soil formation by decomposing living matter uh, or matter that was once living, organic matter. So when a tree falls uh, and all of this wood, this mass of wood is lying there, um, if it wasn't digested by fungi, then it wouldn't be able to uh, re-enter these, um, these cycles of uh, these metabolic cycles in which we live. And so fungi play a really important role in recycling uh, matter and transforming one thing into another. They're metabolically ingenious and can um, can do this in, in a very gifted and remarkable way. So those are two ways that they do they help with the formation of soil. And is it because this is something I when I was reading your book I, I became curious about and this is probably completely nonsensical. But is are fungi the only sort of living organism that decompose things that does this? Are they the only ones who do this? For example decomposing the, 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 the tree that has fallen? Are they the only ones who do that? Or are there other uh, uh, non-fungi kingdom uh, uh, living beings that do that as well? So no, they don't operate alone. They're, they're uh, particularly gifted uh, at decomposition, but bacteria play a very important okay. role, whether free living bacteria or the bacteria living inside fungi. You know, fungi have microbiomes just like we do, mm -hmm. and they have bacteria that live inside their networks and which allow fungi to do certain things they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But also um, uh, an animals, small animals in the soil play a very important part by chomping things into smaller pieces um, or by cultivating fungi, like termites, for example, mm -hmm. cultivate fungi in, in their mounds and they bring chomped up wood to feed the fungus. The fungus decomposes the wood, 
termites eat the slurry. Uh, and much of the wood that's decomposed in uh, the African tropics passes through a termite mound. So you have these interesting collaborations. So animals also, animals also play a part. Everyone's working together. So uh, about, if we go back a little bit, uh, you, collaboration between animals and fungi and so on, I'm very interested in what you, ex what you explained a little bit about uh, in the very beginning, this algae coming onto uh, the shores, on the land and so on, and needing, having uh, fungi actually function as their roots for, I don't know how long, Couple of million years, maybe a couple no, of tens? No, no, like 50, 50, 60 million years. Oh wow, 50, 60 million years. And, and that's something which brings me to, uh, in your book you explain how uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, relationships between uh, living organisms, right? So where uh, we've come to a new understanding or we're sort of exploring new insights into the ways in which in nature collaboration works. Um, and it's really interesting. In your book, you kind of take us a little bit on a journey of the history of science in understanding things like parasites, symbiotic relationships, and so on. Could you kind of tell our audience a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so fungi have played a really key role in the understanding of um, cooperation and, and collaboration in, in the living world. And um, so lichens are the key players here, the, the stars of the show, they're, they're, they're kind of symbiotic icons. Um, poster organisms mm. for symbiosis. In fact, um, in the 18, in the mid 19th century, um, the germs, like there was a thing called the germ theory of disease, and, and um, when you, when larger organisms shared bodily space with smaller organisms like bacteria, it was assumed that this was uh, one of disease or parasitism. So it was not going to end well. Um, the larger organism was being a host and was being um, uh, troubled in some way by these smaller organisms. But in lichens. It turned out, as one um, Swiss botanist um, observed, that um, more than one organism seemed to be living together. And he, su he suggested the dual hypothesis of lichens, that lichens were not just a lower plant, as they'd been assumed to be, but were actually a fungus and an alga growing together uh, and, and doing, um, playing different roles key to the persistence of the overall organism. And he was laughed out of the house because it was impossible for people to um, to come to terms with the fact that you might have what they called a, a useful and invigorating parasitism. Mm -hmm. um, so his ideas eventually became adopted because it became clear that that's what was going on. Uh, and uh, a, a biologist called Albert Frank, in his study of lichens, brought into biology a word called symbiosis. Mm -hmm. And symbiosis was a word that he brought into biology to describe the ways that organisms could form relationships um, that could stretch from parasitism at one pole to mutually beneficial relationships on the other pole. Symbiosis in included them all. They didn't presume to understand the dynamics of the exchange. It just could describe in an unbiased way the, the process of living together. Uh, and after this word was coined, then a number of fascinating new symbiotic discover discoveries were made, like um, corals, for example, or plants and mycorrhizal fungi. So this was really a, a, an important moment. And, um, this obviously had big implications for evolution because if organisms were living together in this intimate way, creating uh, a shared body, then what did that mean for our understanding of how organisms evolved over long stretches of time? They were not evolving separately from each other, they were evolving in some way together. Mm. Uh, and so this led on later to, um, to the ideas in the 20th century of um, Lynn Margulis, who was a, a, a very visionary and, and vocal proponent of the ideas that, that uh, evolutionary novelty in a number of key moments had arisen by the coming together and staying together of unrelated organisms and what she called um, the long lasting intimacy of strangers. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is a beautiful idea. And, in, and what it basically means is that rather than the tree of life being something which just branches and branches and branches, distant branches of the tree can come together and fuse, melt together into an inseparable new lineage. So this really changes uh, our understanding of, uh, of how life proceeds and, and what the history of life actually looks like if you were to draw it. Yeah, but this is the reason why lichen are, uh, are not necessarily fungi species, but they're, no, they're also not an algae species, but they're also not a plant species, right? They're a different life form and you have mm -hmm. all kinds of different sorts of lichens, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah, it's a lifestyle. And one of the things I found also interesting um, in discovering this whole field of, of science, um, I'm not a scientist myself, obviously, uh, but this has been really, and this is maybe something for the audience, 
uh, another reason to buy and read uh, 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 Merlin's book is um, it's extremely poetic. I never knew that uh, scientists, biologists could be so poetic and, uh, and uh, things like long lasting intimacy between strang strangers. Oh, that's, that, that's, that's Lynn Margulis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you have a hand of that as well. You I mean, you're very, please read it. It's, uh, it's uh, incredibly uh, rich, poetically speaking, I think. But anyways, but one of the things I found really interesting is finding out that these kind of processes, these symbiotic and what, what is also holobiont assemblages, also relate to our bodies as well, right? So there are um, foreign strangers with which we form long-lasting intim uh, 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 intimacies with, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, who else in, in, in inhabits our bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so exactly. So the idea of lichens sort of generalized then um, to, to all of life, and, and we're a part of that. So um, we have bacteria and fungi that live in us and on us, without which we couldn't grow and do, behave as we do, um, play crucial roles. In fact, we carry around more microbial cells than our own cells. Um, and, and this really raises all sorts of interesting questions about individuality. Um, we're not alone. Um, fungi have bacteria that live inside them. Big bacteria can have small bacteria living inside them. Mm -hmm. Big viruses can have small viruses living inside them. It really is its relationship all the way down uh, and all the way up. So um, the question of what is an individual becomes a really fascinating question uh, without a good answer. And, and it's one of those questions, I think, that, that, that it's just good to sit in and, and be puzzled by. Um, we obviously need to identify individuals for various different reasons, like when we're filling out our passport application forms, um, <laughs> it's important to put in our taxes. There are some things it's helpful to be able to identify individuals, but um, I think the, the, what it really does, this question, is make individual, the idea of the individual, not a natural fact, but rather a category that depends on our point of view. Mm. Um, and I think all sorts of things start to change when, when, when we um, take that on board. Yeah, I was particularly struck by the by the realization or the knowledge that uh, some of our immune system functions are actually complemented by the fungi and bacteria in our body, so that um, our ability to survive, to fight off foreign, uh, uh, perhaps disease-carrying viruses or whatever, depend on um, the cells of other beings. That's really that was a bit of a mind-blowing thing to me mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's one of these one of the ways in which this starts to change our understanding you know, the way the immune systems used to be understood is as um kind of defensive structures defensive systems that um that made sure that the fortress of our bodies um stayed uh stayed unperturbed by all them all those others out there um but in fact it seems to be rather that our immune systems have evolved to regulate the populations of microbes that live in us um, that actually it's a more of a, um, a kind of a balancing um, system than an than exclusionary one. So, yeah, all sorts of things start to change when, when, we, when we take on these viewpoints. Listen, Melvin, my time, my clock is telling me that we're actually, we have only a minute left. Can you believe that? <laughs> Can you believe that? I have a whole list of topics I wanted to go over with you, but 20 minutes are just simply not enough. Uh, maybe to conclude... Uh, one of the things that you talk about is what you're calling radical mycology. Can you maybe give us, uh, I don't know, in, in the last few seconds that we've got, maybe 30 seconds, I don't know, uh, a bit of an insight in what that is, what that means, and what you think it can do for the future? So mycology and the study of fungi has been neglected. And, and for too long, it's been impossible to study this in any um, sort of joined up way within academic institutions because they're, they're Fungi were not recognized as their own kingdom, so they didn't have a kingdom's worth of attention, a kingdom's worth of professors and students and funding. Um, so for a long time, the study of fungi and, and has been conducted by passionate amateurs, mm. um, an amateur in the best sense, amateur from the Latin ammo to, to love. Um, and so it has, you know, it's much of science was conducted this way until the mid 19th century when things started to get more professionalized and departmentalized. But um, but today, the amateur, the grassroots study of fungi is, is uh, still bustling and active and growing. And um, radical mycology is the name given to um, a kind of 
grassroots mycological movement by, by a mycologist called Peter McCoy, who runs an organization called Radical Mycology. And his vision is to empower people, uh, people who might not have had university training, um, empower people to investigate fungi, to work with fungi, to cultivate them, to find out new things about fungi and how we can partner with them in new, uh, interesting ways that might help us adapt to some of the problems that we face. Yeah, I, it, I think it's a very interesting and very exciting ways of where some of that amateur, that passionate and the, the, the science is driven forward by people who are just passionate about knowledge and about, you know, uh, discovery and so on. I think that's really... Um, to me, it feels very promising where uh, mm -hmm. some of that knowledge seeking happens outside of the university, outside of the laboratory, but it's kind of democratized and it's something that we all can take part of and claim ownership of. Um, I am extremely happy that we were able to have this conversation. I wish we could have had more time because there's so much we wanted to talk about, intelligence, consciousness, all kinds of exciting things, but our time is up. Merlin, thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you for having me. It's yeah. been wonderful. Yeah. Maybe we'll have another shot at this one time in the future. That would be great. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Olava. Although because the internet is also failing us, you couldn't even join us this evening via the video live streaming. But thank you anyway. Um, if you feel the same as Olava, and if you thought that the video was a bit short, I invite you to go and watch, go and see the um, the website of Merlin Sheldrick, where you would find uh, some very cheerful videos of um, oyster mushrooms sprouting out of the book of Merlin and he eating these mushrooms. There's even a video of Merlin playing a real-time sonic a representation of the activity of the mushrooms uh, while they're devouring the book. Um, but now uh, let's go to our second speaker of the evening, uh, Evelyn. Evelyn Peters um, is a microbi is an, um, microbiologist at the VB. She's an associate associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering Sciences um, at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, where she find, founded a research group in molecular bi microbiology and microbial microbial biotechnology. It's clear that it's not really my uh, cup. <laughs> Um, and she's combining a fundamental research with application-driven research. And together with some uh, colleagues in architectural engineering and material sciences, Evelyn has also established an interdisciplinary research consortium that focuses on research and development of the use of filamentous fungi for material ap applications, the so-called so mycelium materials, as you can see them here, and she will definitely show them to you. Uh, so please give a warm applause for Evelyn Peters. Thank you, Hudela. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to see a room filled with so many uh, people interested to learn and discuss about fungi. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a bit about fungi from a technological perspective, uh, and I will tell you more about mycelium materials. But first I want to ask you in the audience, who has ever heard about mycelium materials before? Oh, I'm happy to see that. I think maybe half of the, <laughs> of the audience has already heard about it. Or are there maybe people here that have experimented with mycelium materials, maybe in their kitchen? Yeah, there's two people there. Oh, I'm great. that's great to see. <laughs> so mycelium materials, to me, it shows that fungi have not only played a very important role in shaping the world as we know it today and nature, uh, but that they might also, and this is my belief, that they might also play a very important role in shaping the future world in which we will live. And I'm convinced that they will be able to help us dealing with some of the challenges that we are facing. Uh, and the story about mycelium materials at VUB uh, is starting with Elise. 
please meet Elise Elsacker. And Elise is really an example of the, the so-called radical mycology movement that Merlin was referring to. She's not part of that movement, but she's really a nice example because Elise was an architect. She did not, not know too much about biology, but nevertheless, she was the pioneer that introduced the research on mycelium materials at VUB. About four years ago, Elisa was very concerned, like many, uh, many people, especially of her generation, about what's happening with planet Earth, um, how we are um, relying on the linear economy that is using uh, petrochemicals uh, and fossil oils, and how we are actually yeah, devastating this planet um, with climate change, and how we are really taking all the resources from, from planet Earth without giving anything back. Instead, we're polluting planet Earth. Um, think about the plastics in the ocean uh, that are having such negative consequences on, on the ecosystems. And Elise was really concerned, and she had a dream that she could contribute to solving these problems. And she really enjoyed walking in, in forests, in nature, being in nature, and she, she became fascinated by fungi. She saw the, the fruiting bodies that we all know um, growing on the trees, and, and she really had this idea, this looks like an interesting material, and it was her perspective as an architect, she was working as an architect, like, wow, these are fascinating materials, and this, this is how she became interested in mycelium materials. So what are mycelium materials? As you learned from Merlin, uh, mycelium is actually the, the underground network of the fungi that we don't see, that we don't observe when we're walking in the forest. But the, the forest soils, they are filled with this mycelium network. Um, and like Merlin explained, they can grow and decompose and degrade so many types of organic uh, compounds, even very hard wood-like um, uh, compounds. And when they grow, they develop these very strong cell wall structures. Merlin explained that they contain chitin, which is also the main component of, of shellfish, so it's really hard material. And if you grow this mycelium in the lab, you could do this in a mold uh, using fibers. So these could be organic substrates uh, that you have uh, at hand. So there's many different types of fibers or organic substrates that you could use. And in this way, the mycelium will glue the fibers together and form a very dense material. And that's what we call the composite materials. So they're built of the fibers that are still present in the material, um, but you also see the, the mycelium. So the white appearance is coming from the mycelium network. And these are very strong, um, lightweight, interesting materials. And as an architect, you could immediately see a possible application as a, as a building material. So very interesting. And Elisa came to VUB, she came to me and some of my colleagues, my colleague at the architectural engineering department, uh, with the question, I would like to do research on my ceiling materials. She was experimenting with this also in her kitchen, and that's how the story started uh, at VUB and how he became very interested in these materials. Here you can see some of the growth setups from Elise, growing big blocks of composite um, mycelium material. So here you see the setup at the start. So you can see the, the fibers in the molds. And then after about two weeks of growing, it becomes entirely white. Um, and that's when we end the growth process by uh, drying uh, and heating the material and thereby killing the fungi, so the organism is not alive anymore uh, after this, this process. And we end up with this kind of material. 
and afterwards you can do different steps, post-processing steps. Here you can see Elise using a, a press uh, to press the material and you can get different uh, shapes and densities. Uh, yeah, you can see different possibilities uh, for these uh, materials. And Elisa started experimenting, um, and she also came into the, the microbiology lab, even though initially she did not have this background. And that's where she, um, where she also started interacting with biologists and bioengineers. And Simon van der Loek is one of my PhD researchers. He's a, a biologist by training. He knows a lot about fungi. And he also really became interested um, by this, uh, this application and by the, the process of growing fungi into materials. And he became interested in a different type of growth setup, where he actually grows the, the fungi on the, on the solid substrate in conditions where he stresses the organism. So he, incre he incre increases the CO2 concentration uh, in, the, in a growth incubation chamber. And this stresses the, the mycelium to grow in a very non-natural fashion. Instead of growing inside the substrate as it would usually do also in the forest, it starts to grow into the air, trying to escape these adverse conditions. And as a consequence, we get like a layer of pure mycelium, mycelium foam. And this is maybe an even more interesting material that we, that we obtain. It's completely made out of the, the mycelium um, structure. Uh, and it can have a foam-like, but also a textile and even leather-like appearance and, and strength. So now we can see so many more applications. And actually, it's really, flexible material and the properties are tunable. So depending on the growth conditions or the species or strain of fungi that we use, we can really create so many different types of materials, tuning their properties. It can be paper-like or leather-like or very hard wood-like um, or textile-like and there's so many applications possible. And the reason that this is such an important process of producing materials and using them is that it is completely bio-based, CO2 neutral and circular. So it can fit in this uh, perspective of a circular economy where we start off with waste material, we can use agricultural residues or other types of maybe kitchen waste. Um, all kinds of organic materials can be used as a starting point. We grow our material, our product. Um, here it's shown for the composite materials. Uh, after a growth process, about two weeks, we dry the material, killing off the fung fungus. Then we can do some post-processing. We have a material that we can use. And at the end of the lifespan, it's completely biodegradable. Um, and so this is really also a paradigm shift, I would say. Yeah, and so the application possibilities are endless. And we're just at the start of discovering what is possible with this material. Like I mentioned, we can really tune the properties. We can think about applications in, uh, in construction. Um, in building materials or isolation materials or packaging materials. It also resembles styrofoam, the, the composite materials. Here you can see some applications where they use mycelium materials for acoustic tiles or floor tiles. There's many possibilities. And with the pure mycelium materials, there's maybe quite some applications possible in the fashion industry. Um, as clothing or shoes or for bags, also as a substitute for animal leather. And I was really pleased to see that Adidas and Hermes have both introduced a prototype um, of a shoe and a bag that is composed partly of, 
of mycelium. So I hope this is a step in the direction of commercializing mycelium-based products. And this brings me to the question of what is the best valorization route, because the technology is there, it exists already quite some, some years now, but we don't really see a breakthrough. I don't think we can see it already in the, in the stores. Um, and so the question is, why is it not yet there? And what would be the pathway to, to valorization? Because we have to create an impact. On one hand, we can think of a large-scale industrialization, and that's one of the routes. But on the other side, I'm also thinking about very small-scale and local applications that are really accessible to anybody, to, to any person who would like to grow something <laughs> at home and then use it and then after using it, um, degrading it and then <laughs> growing something else. Um, and so we are really working towards these two valorization routes because I think both of them are, are necessary. Um, on one hand, um, Elisa was involved in a large European project where they really looked at how can we use waste on a bigger scale uh, to grow these materials and to really think about upscaling. Um, and on, on, there's also some companies that are looking into um, in, yeah, building infrastructure to grow mycelium materials on a large scale. For example, the US company Ecovative Design, they have this uh, setup where they can grow the the pure mycelium foam, like I, sh I mentioned, um, under the stress conditions, um, in big trays on a large scale. But I'm convinced that we also need this small scale approach. And it will be important to bring the materials very close to the people and to, to create awareness, because I think that's, that's also a big bottleneck. Uh, I can imagine I'm not sure, but I think there's quite some people out there that are really reluctant about um, <coughs> fungal materials um, and having their houses built <laughs> with, uh, with fungus. Well, they, they have this negative connotation about fungus in a house. So I think we still have quite some work to do to create this awareness. And in this context, we find it important. And I think the development of mycelium materials has, has always proceeded in this way to keep it um, very accessible uh, and bring it close to the people. And here you can see Elise in one of her workshops that she organized for children. Um, teaching them how, how they can make their own, or they can grow their own mycelium materials. So this is just as important as thinking about large-scale uh, industrial uh, infrastructure. So with that, I, I would like to end by telling you a bit more about the research that we do at VUB. Um, so it was all pioneered by Elise. Uh, she's now in Newcastle for a postdoctoral um, research stay, but the research at VUB is continuing, and it's a very nice example of real interdisciplinary research where we collaborate between microbiologists, we really look at the biology of the organism and how we can use that understanding to tune the materials. Material scientists will go very deep into understanding how the properties and the composition of the material leads to the structural um, properties and, and um, the performance of the material. And then we have the collaboration with the architectural engineering um, and they look at it from a larger scale and how we can develop architectural applications. And it's real interdisciplinary um, work because we really want to um, develop an understanding where we can have a code of these are the biological characteristics that determine these type of material properties. And with that, I would like to, to thank all the people involved. Here you can see all the researchers at VUB. So Elise is there, but we have built a small ecosystem of other scientists uh, that are 
working in this interdisciplinary consortium. And we also are very grateful for uh, national and international collaborations with other scientists mentioned here uh, that also contribute to this research. With that, I want to thank you for your attention to listen to my story. And I also invite you to come and feel the materials maybe afterwards, if that's possible. They are here and yeah, you can come and feel them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, um, Evelyn. They're indeed very tactile uh, materials. It's not only uh, looking at them, uh, you really have to feel them. Um, we will, I will now give the floor to Camille Barton and uh, Erika Spree. Um, you know, actually, Olava would have done the interview with um, Camille, but um, as you can see, it's not that easy to replace Olava by only one person. We had to find another one. Um, so please come and have a seat. Um, you know, Erika is uh, working at, um, at the Kai Theater. She's part of the, the artistic team here, uh, but she also is a programmer of the Studium Generale um, at the Royal Academy of the Arts uh, in, in The Hague. Um, so welcome. Uh, Camille and Erika, give them a warm applause. Hi, Camille. Hi, Erika. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, talking with you. I know you from the Studium Generale in The Hague. We work together in a program on, well, many things that are related to what we're talking about tonight. So I'm going to introduce you. Uh, Camille Barton, you go with pronouns they, them, is an interdisciplinary artist, educator, and renegade researcher working on the intersections of embodiment and healing justice. Camille, you're the head of the Ecologies of Transformation, a temporary master's program at the Sandberg uh, Institute in Amsterdam, exploring how art making and embodiment can facilitate social change. Uh, at this moment, uh, you're completing uh, your research on grief uh, together with the Global Environments uh, Network. Uh, you are creating a toolkit for embodied grief rituals to support ecological solidarity work. And last but not least, and this also <laughs> entangles with what we're going to talk tonight, is you're an advisor for the American nonprofit organization MAPS ensuring that psychedelic assisted therapies will be accessible to communities of color, uh, people that are mostly harmed by the war on drugs. So yeah, now we're gonna tune into a very specific uh, family in the kingdom. <laughs> and we are both part of the psilocybin mushroom appreciation or re-appreciation society, I would say. Um, yeah, there's a, also a reappreciation of uh, mushrooms going on or fungi uh, in the sense that more um, funding, attention, uh, validity is going to uh, research on psychedelics and especially psilos psilocybin mushrooms. So, yeah, science and psychedelics are two words, and I'm going to unpack this a little bit because. Traditionally, let's say historically, science and psychedelics are, don't sit very easily together. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> to put it on the table, and I know I have a lot of scientists here as well, but maybe also psilocybin appreciators. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, science has definitely, uh, it's uh, 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 yeah, a, a, a construct with very deep colonial uh, Western roots um, that uh, yeah, have definitely led to a devaluation of uh, indigenous practices or that we would call them the guardians of these uh, mushrooms that they use as uh, their medicinal practice mm -hmm. or like their, uh, it's also entangled with their cosmology, with their way of life. Um, so th this is something that has happened historically, but then also more recently science has had trouble to see, take uh, psilocybin mushrooms uh, as a serious uh, object of study, labeling it as drugs, um, and therefore something to be repressed, 
or yeah, to be uh, not taken serious. And then at the same time, uh, to quote you, um, there's also a promise now in, psy in psilocybin mushrooms that is being recognized. And to quote you, yeah, psychedelic research has the potential to heal trauma and create positive social change in the world. So this seems like, you know, uh, uh, there's a paradox there. Could you mm -hmm. give words to that, how that is for you? Yeah, definitely. It's um, an interesting time to be enthusiastic about psychedelics. Um, I'm really questioning my role in the movement a lot at the moment because the corporatization of the space is quite troubling to me and the medical model is quite troubling. I know we're going to talk about that later. I suppose the first thing I'd like to say is that psychedelics as a term is a pretty Western, quite recent term. Um, and it's a way of describing uh, what some people would call sacred earth medicines or substances that create altered states of consciousness. Um, and these altered states can have a range of applications. I think what's important to say is context is everything. So the context in which psychedelics or sacred earth medicines are used in indigenous contexts have a very different framing to what we now see in the Western um, psychedelic renaissance, as people are calling it. Um, on this piece of context, I guess, just uh, sort of talking a little bit to what Merlin was saying about this notion of the individual, um, psychedelic science right now in a Western context is very much focused on this idea of the individual, on individualized healing, on seeing our problems, our traumas as very individual rather than collective issues, rather than societal issues, um, and looking at the ways that individuals can heal. Whereas in an indigenous context, um, the usage of these substances would be more around uh, cosmologies and reinforcing ways of knowing and relationships with land and each other. So it's a very, very different framing and I think has a lot of implications for how this movement might develop. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to also relate a little bit uh, to myself in that sense because um, I, I was uh, living in Amsterdam when uh, psych psilocybin mushrooms uh, were on sale. Huh? They were commercialized, they were sold. Uh, this became like, well, not the 60s, but a second boom of uh, taking mushrooms uh, as recreation, you could say. And there was a bit of exoticizing in this, not being really aware where these mushrooms would come from, from what in what kind of cultures. Uh, they had a huge ancestral uh, history. We were just having like fun, you know, they were being sold in, in this sense, you know. Um, uh, I really hope that uh, with this kind of new momentum that we're having, that there's more awareness of uh, uh, where these uh, practices come from. Um, also, like, as you said, no, these altered states, yeah, people take them to have, like, these altered states, and it's a very individual thing. Uh, yeah, how, I know with MAPS, uh, you did, like, a really great, great, wonderful job. I really, like, recommend everybody to read the article that uh, Camille wrote for, uh, yeah, your fellowship or your research position at MAPS. Um, where you rec yeah, where you recommend basically some practices on how to create this awareness. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to that, like some kind of? Yeah, sure. I mean, my relationship with Maps is ongoing and it's kind of been this nebulous thing um, where I guess I've been a consultant and or an advisor at different points, um, and working quite closely with Natalie and Izzy, who do a lot of the policy and advocacy work at Maps. Um, and yeah, for a while we were just in conversation for a long time about how to really create more conversation around racial justice, around indigenous reciprocity in the space, um, because that seemed to be quite absent even just four or five years ago. So it's wonderful that in the in the conversation there's more awareness of these themes, but there's still a long way to go. Um, in bringing it to some of the points, I guess, that were made in that article that I wrote, um, within the medicalization of psychedelics, I think it's important that we have therapists from a range of different backgrounds who can really hold um, a caring space for people of difference um, and thinking about what that looks like because we have a lot of ongoing issues in our society, whether that's around racism, ableism, sexism, 
Um, and I think that these issues are not just in policy, but are really embodied and relational. Um, and there have been quite difficult experiences for people in therapy sessions and the clinical trials um, who haven't felt very supported. Um, and that's potentially been a bit re-traumatizing in certain moments when people are vulnerable in these altered states and needing very specific support. Um, so one of the things that we put forward was a real initiative to try and train uh, more black therapists, more therapists from a range of different um, backgrounds, also queer therapists, so there could be a little bit more lived experience and understanding of the certain trauma material that people might be bringing into psychedelic therapy sessions. Mm. Um, but we also feel that there needs to be more indigenous stakeholders really involved in how the movement is shaped um, and thinking about how we ensure that land is really uh, preserved to allow indigenous communities to access their medicines because an ongoing debate right now is around peyote um, and the decriminalization move efforts that are happening in the United States. Um, and many communities that use peyote don't want this to be decriminalized because at the moment it's already being overharvested and extracted a lot for Western use. Um, so some of the issues we need to think about, I suppose, as psychedelic enthusiasts is um, how do we access these medicines in a way that allows the indigenous holders of these traditions and lineages to still actually be able to use their medicine to access it themselves um, and to really think about prioritizing that because the way that this relationship is is structured at the moment with those of us in the west is thinking well it's for everyone so let's just take as much of it as we want and not actually having very much care for those whose mm -hmm. systems of worldviews religions spiritual practices are intimately tied to these medicines in a way that they're not for us I think that just perpetuates um, a lot of colonial dynamics and yeah, I um, a lot of harm. It's, yeah, it's not a fungi, but I found this in, especially in relationship to ayahuasca, for example. So that's hugely uh, in the mainstream now. I mean, maybe not <laughs> for everybody in the mainstream, but it's been really, uh, yeah, very, for me, surprising to see... Uh, Ayahuasca being so widely popular now, and then at the same time, uh, the Amazon uh, is burning, and there are all these laws pass, uh, pa being passed that this own, uh, yeah, the, the indigenous people taking the ayahuasca, and then, yeah, there's of course there's an incongruence there or some kind of cognitive dissonance for people taking ayahuasca and not taking this kind of social uh, justice. Uh, issue or a dimension into account um, so yeah <laughs> it's not really a question but like um, yeah how how because this is something that I find very interesting no would you say this is kind of uh, more on the agenda to take in the social aspects of, of the whole like as you said no like the, the extraction like we don't or to put it this way we're not here to only take and be like, oh, this is really interesting to heal and this is a very interesting uh, mushroom with s certain qualities, let's, let's use it as a medicine. Um, but then the question is, but what do you give back, right? Or what, uh, yeah, what are you giving back to the community the mushroom is from? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot in there. Um, I think ultimately to me it feels like we need to redefine what reciprocity, well, feel into what reciprocity is and how we practice relational care. Um, if we're learning from mycelial networks and the role they play in ecosystems, it's around collaboration and interdependence and our societies in the West are not really structured in that way. Um, there's a lot we could learn from mycelial networks and being able to really consider how we show up to be in right relationship with each other. Um, and I think the, the kind of Western... Um, kind of psychedelic re revolution that we think about in the 1960s really set off on this foot of extraction and, and taking unconsensually from Mazatec communities. So someone you might have heard of is Maria Sabina, who was a Mazatec elder in Mexico, um, holding a lineage of mushroom traditions and um, sacred mushroom work ceremonies. And Gordon Wasson was a uh, a Westerner who came over and stumbled across Maria Sabina's community and she agreed to hold some sessions for him on the condition that he wouldn't talk about the community. Um, he wouldn't share this information about where they were, 
or any of her personal information. Um, but then he went back to the West and he published an article in Life magazine. <laughs> yeah. And this then the was Beatles what, came. Yeah. And then this whole <laughs> stream the of step. Westerners came searching yeah. for the sacred mushroom. Yeah. Um, and it destroyed, it really destroyed her life. Um, she got kind of ostracized in her community. One of her children ended up dying. It was very, very tragic. And I think set the tone for this very extractive relationship that Westerners have had with um, these exotic indigenous others that we seem to think, yeah, come and heal us, and then not care that there's ongoing genocide or oil companies who are destroying their ways of living, um, their ability to exist. So I think we really have to consider, yeah, what reciprocity looks like if we think these traditions have value to us. What are we giving back? What is the exchange that feels fair? Um, and we think we have to learn how to practice that because colonization has been this ongoing 500 year process now of extraction. Mm. And that continues in the way that we take from the global south in order to sustain we, the way we live in the global north. So I think there's a lot there in this movement that we're seeing uh, with the medicalization of psychedelics, as I suppose just a continuation of that framework of taking, rather than thinking about what does this look like in the relational web of life? Um, what opportunities do we have as psychedelic medicines proliferate to really consider how we structure our societies and how we um, rebalance power and, mm. and how we share care practices. And also, um, yeah, what I find fascinating, one of the things that uh, you're also exploring is how exactly psych these mushrooms can be also medicine to, re to heal race racial trauma. So it's not only about uh, the uh, addressing the, the the racism that might be uh, implicit in the whole psychedelic uh, or in the research uh, psychedelic research, but also uh, could you speak to that? Like how uh, how could this be uh, a medicine for this intergenerational uh, trauma? Hmm. So I think I'm very interested in in colonization um, and seeing that as a process rather than just this historical thing that happened over there, but looking at how its legacies um, impact the ways we live today. Um, and one of these, these threads for me feels quite connected to psychedelics really in that during colonization, um, one of the first things that the British did, for example, in Nigeria, which is part of my ancestry, I'm part Yoruba, um, is to colonize the people. They banned all of our rituals. They banned our use of plant medicine. They banned our use of drums, of anything that kind of connected us to ancestors and um, ways of knowing that supported our worldview. And then that was replaced with Western things. So I think this is the kind of initial trauma and rupture for many mm -hmm. migrant communities, many people in the diaspora, having that disconnection from our indigenous ways. Um, and ways of actually connecting to ancestors and to our spiritual practices. Um, and that kind of severing being all the more intensified when you are kind of forced to assimilate, but then still kind of uh, placed into this category of other. And um, I know we're going to talk about the war on drugs soon, but that really being exacerbated by the war on drugs and these systems that continue to uh, criminalize, incarcerate, and at times kill. Uh, black and brown people because of the stigma and association with drugs. So I think uh, coming full circle, there's a, a real opportunity to prioritize psychedelic therapies for um, communities who have histories of migration and displacement, communities who have recently experienced colonization, um, because they can um, provide a way to connect back to spiritual traditions and also increase neuroplasticity and um, even on a brain level, really repattern some of the ways that trauma impacts our brain, whether that's the amygdala, which is kind of the watchtower in our brains that kind of senses for danger, and the ways that uh, if you experience a lot of racism, other marginalization, um, that can be very heightened. The amygdala can be overstimulated, so there's a sense of hypervigilance, really not feeling very safe in day-to-day -day existence. So. Um, yeah, there's a lot of potential for, for healing, but I think the movement needs to, I guess, reckon with, with colonization and the war on drugs. So maybe we can segue to, to speak about that a bit. Yeah, because uh, to go a layer deeper, no, the, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, anti-racism practices that can be done in the research of psilocybin, no? like going from 
uh, making uh, BIPOC spaces in conferences to uh, donate certain amounts of money to uh, uh, restore certain indigenous lands. No, so that it's not a, only about this conference, but that you're actually also investing uh, in indigenous uh, communities. Well, there's a whole list of things, great things that we should do. Um, but then there's, uh, yeah, there's a layer deeper in, let's say, uh, the oppression, the, the the war on drugs, that is really like one of the main uh, oppressive tools that we need to address. And so maybe we can show a little video uh, where this is very shortly explained. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the technique. Is there a video? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> In 1986, when I was coming of age, Ronald Reagan doubled down on the war on drugs that had been started by Richard Nixon in 1971. Drugs were bad, fried your brain. And drug dealers were monsters, the sole reason neighborhoods and major cities were failing. No one wanted to talk about Reaganomics and the ending of social safety nets, the defunding of schools and the loss of jobs in cities across America. Young men like me who hustled became the sole villain and drug addicts lacked moral fortitude. In the 1990s, incarceration rates in the US blew up. Today, we imprison more people than any other country in the world. China, Russia, Iran, Cuba. All countries we consider autocratic and repressive. Yeah, more than them. Judges' hands were tied by tough-on-crime laws, and they were forced to hand out mandatory life sentences for simple possession and low-level drug sales. My home state of New York started this with Rockefeller laws. Then the feds made distinctions between people who sold powder cocaine and crack cocaine even though they were the same drug. Only difference is how you take it. And even though white people used and sold crack more than black people, somehow it was black people who went to prison. The media ignored actual data to this day. Crack is still talked about as a black problem. The NYPD raided our Brooklyn neighborhoods while Manhattan bankers openly used coke with impunity. The war on drugs exploded the US prison population disproportionately locking away black and Latinos. Our prison population grew more than 900%. When the war on drugs began in 1971, our prison population was 200,000. Today it is over 2 million. Long after the crack era ended, we continued our war on drugs. There were more than 1.5 million drug arrests in 2014. More than 80% were for possession only. Almost half were for marijuana. People are finally talking about treating addiction to harder drugs as a health crisis but there's no compassionate language about drug dealers. Unless, of course, we're talking about places like Colorado, whose state economy got a huge boost by the above-ground marijuana industry. A few states south in Louisiana, they're still handing out mandatory sentences for people who sell weed, despite a boom in a celebrated 50 billion legal marijuana industry. Most states still disproportionately hand out mandatory sentences to black and Latinos with drug cases. If you're entrepreneurial and live in one of the many states that are passing legalized laws, you may still face barriers participating in the above ground economy. Venture capitalists migrate to these states to open multi-billion dollar operations, but former felons can't open a dispensary. Lots of times those felonies were drug charges, caught by poor people who sold drugs for a living, but are now prohibited from participating in one of the fastest growing economies. Got it? In states like New York, where holding marijuana is no longer grounds for arrest, police issue possession citations in black and Latino neighborhoods at a far higher rate than other neighborhoods. Kids in Crown Heights are constantly stopped and ticketed for trees. Kids at dorms in Columbia, where rates of marijuana use are equal to or worse than those in the hood, are never targeted or ticketed. Rates of drug use are as high as they were when Nixon declared this so-called war in 1971. 45 years later, it's time to rethink our policies and laws. The war on drugs is an epic fail. So that's just a really brief snapshot. Um, it's quite a wormhole to go into the war on drugs, especially um, looking at it outside of the US context, because that's mostly what people associate it with. Oh, this is just happening in the USA, but it's really a global phenomenon. Um, for those that are interested in an organization that does a lot of research in the UK context, um, check out Release. They have some great policy papers. Uh, their most recent one was called The Color of Injustice, 
where they demonstrate quite clearly um, that drug policies are being used in the UK as a form of social and racial control, where even though personal possession is decreasing, um, sorry, policing around personal possession is decreasing for white people, it's remaining the same for black and brown communities. Um, and rates of uh, kind of sentencing to prison are disproportionately much higher. Um, and so we see that it's not really about the drugs themselves, it's the way that drug policies are used to kind of be weaponized against certain communities. So how does this relate to the psychedelics movement? Well, if we have a medicalized model where you can access these therapies with a doctor, if you pay a certain amount of money, um, that will kind of allow the war on drugs to still operate quite freely, um, where people from certain backgrounds may continue to be criminalized. Um, so I think pursuing psychedelics with a medicalized model that doesn't focus on the war on drugs is just allowing um, this kind of harm to proliferate. And as it stands, white communities generally are not criminalized for using psychedelics, as it, as it is anyway. Um, it's mostly black and brown communities who are really impacted, mostly around marijuana possession. Um, but unless we kind of really focus on this as a form of policy um, reform in the psychedelics movement, then it's not really likely to shift. Um, so that's something I hope that psychedelic enthusiasts can focus on rather than this narrative that's quite dominant of, let's just legalize it, let's just medicalize it. As long as we can access it, it's great. Um, but the reality is there's still a lot of people who are continuing to be harmed um, with policies that kind of emanate from the war on drugs and that need to be shifted, ideally, in order to really create more, more care, more equity. So, in a way, another form of radical mycology, I would say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think we're... Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Camille. It was a, very, a, a, a small snapshot into a big, big world out there, I think. Uh, we really barely touched upon uh, some really deep work. Uh, and thank you so much. I really appreciate you so much, but you know that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think we're now in for a Q&A. Uh, yeah, <laughs> big applause for Thanks, Camille. <laughs> Well, I think we have like um, 10 to 15 minutes left to, for uh, questions from you and to open up the conversation with uh, all of the people of tonight. Um, I think we have a mic somewhere over there, so if somebody has a question, please raise your hand. But there was one thing that I wanted to ask going uh, back to your presentation, uh, Evelyn. Um, and while I was uh, listening to it, and I, I saw the, one of your last images of the pair of Adidas sneakers, and that reminded me of the Paris Fashion Week um, of uh, last month, where uh, we saw Stella McCartney's uh, uh, Spring 2022 collection. Um, and um, during that presentation, I thought it was the mycologist Paul Stamets that we heard reciting, and I quote, in fashion, mushrooms are the future. And I think maybe the same could be said of uh, construction, the food industry, uh, so not only fashion industry. Um, but now I wonder also, recollecting uh, what uh, Camille said, um, you presented the mycelium materials as a solution for uh, a lot of ecological challenges. Um, but I wonder when you start upscaling um, the production of that mycelium materials. Um, and then I, I look at Camille when she said that uh, a lot of over harvesting is done. And then she was talking about the mushrooms not of the mycelium. But I wonder when you start upscaling that production, whether you're not, um, it, well, I think there's a very thin line of uh, um, 
cir between circular economy and extraction and over harvesting. So I don't know if you can elaborate a bit more on that. Are we still talking about um, ecological solutions when uh, you have to when, when you produce a, a natural um, material on such a large scale? Yeah, that's a, a very good question, a good remark. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, it's not an easy answer. I think on one hand, we do have to, to try to reach a certain scale if you want to have an impact. And there's a lot of people in the world, so yeah, we, we have to produce on larger scale and in some way we have to centralize this production. Uh, on the other hand, I, I agree with you that we also should shift um, our, yeah, our behavior in consuming. Uh, and that these mycelium materials, because they are also very accessible on a, on a, um, yeah, on a lower technological level, you can do it at home, that this can also provide um, a, a, a shift in the mindset of consuming. Um, so I think it's, it's both. We need, on one hand, the industry uh, to really um, establish this and, and make it available for everybody, consumer goods like shoes. But on the other hand, we should also use mycelium materials to create this shift. Um, so I think it's a combination of both. Um, I really like the technology because we're not just harvesting nature and extracting it from nature, but we can grow it. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm, I don't see it as a, as a problem of depleting resources. It, it seems to be endless. You can keep on growing and growing. Um, so that would be my perspective. And, um, I guess, I don't know, um, although we're colleagues at the VB, I don't know, the, I guess that the research that you're doing, that, that is patent protected. Um, so how, I don't, maybe it's a very easy answer, but um, I see on the one hand, you have the patent protected research that, um, I guess is um, in collaboration with uh, with with the, the larger industry. Um, and how can I? How do I relate that to the like, like you showed us in the or like you also told us in um, uh, homegrown um, mycelium or um, smaller small scale uh, production of that? Yeah. Also here, it's a combination of both. Uh, so on one hand. Uh, we are protecting part of the research, or we're aiming to protect part of the research that we're doing to make it as accessible for companies to, um, yeah, to develop it on a larger scale. Um, and there's a lot of patenting going on with uh, regards to mycelium material production, but it's all linked to the technology, uh, to the technological um, development of being able to produce it on a larger scale and also to yeah to have strains and production um, conditions that lead to materials that really meet the, the requirements uh, to be able to um, for example to to um, generate uh, building materials that we can really use in a safe way to build houses mm -hmm. um, on the other hand there is a huge worldwide community of, of do-it-yourself scientists, artists, designers that work with these materials and they have a very open atmosphere of sharing knowledge and expertise. And I think both of them have to exist. And like I mentioned also in my presentation, the second um, approach is also very important to bring the materials close to the, the public and to, to get also input from them. Um, to learn also how we should develop the technology so that we can really sell it to the to the large audience. So also here it's a balance of both, which is not always easy, but we try to maintain that balance. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the public? Yeah. From the audience. I'm Noe, and I'm a student at the VUB in uh, human ecology. Um, and yeah, I kind of had the same question, or I think for me, how Camille phrased it uh, was well said that if 
um, with the fact that just trying to legalize psychedelics and not look at the more deeply lying issues that are there within our social fabric um, would transposing this analogy on the broadening of micromaterials in our economic system not also be uh, valid in this case? Wouldn't just going, oh yeah, we'll industrialize um, the, the micromaterials kind of leave behind the fact that in our infrastructural and technological fabric, uh, well, views on, I mean, I mean, the ways of extraction are still present and, and the mentality of extraction and and the material of, of extractive economy is still there. How to phase those out, how to, you know, economically it's a, it's a challenge that, that is unsurmountable, I, I feel like. What's your take on this? Who was your question for? Uh, I guess both of you. Uh, and then we can maybe can start with Camille. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose I've got a few things to say on that. I agree that there are structural issues we need to navigate, and I think, yeah, a lot of people will talk about the need to really shift towards a, uh, an economic system that isn't based on endless growth in order to actually be in alignment with, um, yeah, with the finite resources on our beautiful planet. Um, I think what's exciting, though, about uh, mycelium is that it can be grown in ways that aren't necessarily extractive, like other, dissimilar to other plant medicines like ayahuasca or iboga or peyote that are facing um, are kind of endangered because of overharvesting. Mycelium, you don't have that issue. There isn't kind of a tethering to one indigenous cosmology. And so I think there's a lot of exciting potential of how this could be used in different uh, cultural contexts and ecosystems. But I agree, I think that we need to still deal with the broader issues around extraction in this economy. Um, and as we were speaking about earlier, you know, this technology has existed for a long time, but there's a lot of blocks to actually becoming mainstream because there's so much money in fossil fuels, so much money in plastics and disposable materials. So maybe there's a civil society piece that's really necessary for kind of continuing to creatively demand change and really not wait for companies and governments to, you know, phase in these things as the new normal, but really think about how we can use the technology that's available to create new systems. Maybe I can refer back to Elise, uh, because she was really also um, yeah, fighting against um, yeah, the, the current existing uh, linear economy and that is really extracting the resources. And she also started off her research by being as open as possible and to really fit this in this perspective of we have to change the system. But throughout her research, she started to realize that we actually have a certain urgency. Um, and it's, it's going to take too much time to change the system. And we don't have that time to wait. And that actually the industry can help us uh, in certain ways. And that we agree that the system also has to be changed. But that this is going to be done gradually. And in the meantime, yeah, we have to try to use the industry to, yeah, to get the products mainstream. Um, so, and I think the Adidas shoe is a very nice example because this, their promotion, it kind of evoked a debate and a discussion about micro-materials among citizens. So this is also important. They also help with this awareness, even though that they are really um, a company um, that is focused on consumption and this, this model. Um, yeah, so that's how we, we see it now, yeah. Oh, there's another question over there, first row. Um, this one is for Camille. Do you think we should change how we teach the youth about drugs? Because I feel, at least in Belgium, when we are in high school, we get these drug days and it's very stigmatizing. And if you smoke one joint in a week, you're doing crack cocaine and other bad stuff. And I feel that to, in a way that leads to also stigmatizing the medicinal, medicinal use, but also making communities that use drugs in a safe and special way also look bad. And how can we, if we should change it, how can we balance not 
telling children do drugs, but at the same time really inform them about why it's sometimes it's good to use drugs in certain contexts? <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, I do think that drug education should be massively reformed. Uh, I think Portugal is a really great model to look at where they've decriminalized all substances. And it's not that the Portuguese government is saying, go and do all the drugs. It's that they have a health, um, a public health approach to it where they understand that people are going to use substances and you may as well not criminalize people when they do use them. And if people develop chaotic relationships with certain substances, they have treatment programs. People aren't locked away for having an addiction. There are treatment problem programs and they look at what are the social causes of addiction. You know, why do people get addicted to substances? It's usually because of grief or other forms of trauma. And Gabor Mate has really amazing work on this. Um, so I, yeah, I don't think it's particularly helpful having a um, stigmatizing approach because people don't get the information to use substances safely if and when they choose to, which many, many people do. Um, and also it creates, yeah, criminalization, which tends to target certain communities and create um, a lot of other problems in society. So yeah, I think having a, a public health approach would be ideal and moving towards a situation where we either decriminalize or legalize all substances um, and have, yeah, information available for people who want to use and also try and hopefully create more change in society so people won't have to numb themselves to actually survive <laughs> in this world. So that would be nice, yeah. There are two, two more questions, maybe. Um. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all the speakers for the, for the great talks already so far. Uh, this question is for uh, Camille, uh, because um, I have a friend of mine who is a therapist who is very interested in psychedelic therapy, and you mentioned earlier these relationships of care and how we have to think of these, um, these, these new kind of uh, activities. And one of her concerns is that if the psychedelic renaissance does happen and the medicalization of psychedelics does enter into the legal sphere, this might be seen as a victory, but at the same time, the paradigm there might be that it's seen as something that you can prescribe to someone, they can take on their own, and then it's like as if you pick up a medicine at the drugstore and you can just go do your psychedelics, where she emphasizes the, the importance of preparation, of accompaniment, and integration afterwards, etc., and saying that there's not a lot of, um, I don't know, maybe tradition or, or, or knowledge there yet, to, to allow this to happen. I don't know if you have a point of view on this or if, uh, if there's something you've, you've seen happen as well. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, because um, a lot of this work I started doing when I was living in the United States and they're much closer towards legalization. I mean, ketamine-assisted therapy is already legal in many states because um, it's very, very effective at treating suicidal ideation and depression, anxiety. So you can just get ketamine nasal spray and as you say, just use that at home. Um, there's also intramuscular injections, which require someone to be present with you. It's a, much, it's a different experience. Um, and MAPS, with the research they've been doing, they've just completed phase three clinical trials with MDMA psychotherapy. Um, and that looks like it might have FDA approval as early as next year. And there is a whole protocol that MAPS have developed around um, a very specific type of therapy session that's actually six to eight hours long and very intensive and quite a departure from what we see in traditional psychotherapy. So uh, yeah, I, I, I think it will be interesting um, to see what continues to happen in the United States because I think the European context is maybe five to 10 years behind. There's already states like Oregon that have just legalized psilocybin therapy. And right now I know people who are being approached by the Oregon um, state to actually design protocols around, you know, how do we do this? Because we don't know. Um, in essence, and a lot of the MAPS protocol has been, you know, borrowed or taken from what many people have experienced in indigenous contexts and the way that those containers are facilitated. So I do think there's a need to get to grips with how we situate this work in our own cultural context and whether we're going to continue focusing just on this as individualized healing, 
you know, from the very traumatic society we're living in, or if we're going to move it towards collective healing and thinking about how do we create new cultural norms, new ways of being with each other that will hopefully mean we don't need to rely on antidepressants, all these new shiny psychedelic antidepressants, which is almost how they're being marketed, you know, oh, psilocybin's better than SSRIs, let's just get people on that, which, to your question, doesn't actually change the fabric as to why so many people do need antidepressants or may need psychedelic therapy in order to, yeah, exist. I have a question for Evelyn. What what um, energy source do you need to grow these materials, and how much is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they grow on organic substrates uh, in ambient temperature, uh, 25 degrees on average, um, and a regulated humidity, uh, and that's all you need for the growth process. Uh, so if we look at the energy investments in the in the whole um, production process, I think the, the most um, um, energy requiring or the, the step that requires most energy is drying um, uh, the material at high temperature and killing the, the fungus. Um, there is not much research that has been done on, on life cycle assessments during the production process and from the start until um, the end of the use of the material, but these kind of studies are now being started up, so these are very relevant. Yeah. I have heard you uh, say this evening now three times or even more that you kill the mycelium. <laughs> Is it possible to keep it alive in the material? Yeah, and this is a very relevant question because these are our next research questions. Um, as biologists, uh, we find it a pity that we kill this organism when, when we want to use the material because it's such a fascinating organism. That's what we learned today. It can sense the environment. Uh, it can display behavior that is adapted to what's happening in the environment. And the next step, and there's a whole um, community that is being built on scientists that are working on so-called engineered living materials. The next step is that we want to keep the organism alive and explore how this can give us additional functionalities. Think about a shoe that once it's damaged, it self-heals, or it responds to certain conditions in the environment and then it changes color or it performs any other function and it's this sounds like science fiction but this is really the future and we're starting to to think about these questions and explore this um, if there's any more question from the public we can uh, we can have a quick go otherwise so please raise your hand. And I would say that that will be the last one because it's almost 10 o'clock right now. Hi, uh, I have a question for uh, Evelyn. Uh, you talk about that your material is biodegradable, um, but is it uh, strong enough to replace textiles that we use today and especially in fast fashion? that in the end ends up in the garbage and it doesn't just go away, but you talk about like you want to keep it alive or you want to kill the um, mycelium inside of the, I don't know. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, can it replace um, those fake materials that we make? Yeah, so maybe your question also refers to durability. And if you think about a sustainable consumption model, then we also want to have materials that can last for quite some time. And this is also a question that is being investigated right now in these kind of life cycle assessments. And we do realize that we will need to help the, the material uh, by treating it, and, and they were trying to treat it with, uh, with natural treatments like glycerol or acetic acid or... Um, 
performing additional cross-linking so that it's durable enough during the lifespan um, of the use of the product. Uh, but again, also, these are very pertinent research questions that still need a lot of investigation, but also very relevant. Thank you. Um, well, then I will conclude. Um, thank you. Thank you uh, to the audience for being here tonight. Thank you, Evelyn, Camille, and Erika. Thank you very much. Um, thank you also for the people from the Kai Theater and Friederike and the Jorgos Patsis for helping us with editing the, the very nice video. Um, our next, our third session in the More Than, Seri More Than Human uh, Encounter series is in December um, with Isabel Stenger, Mend Marisol de la Cadena and uh, Minia Tanashescu. Um, I think the live tickets ha are already sold out, but um, it will still be possible if the internet works um, to join via the live stream. Uh, so I wish you all a very, very uh, nice evening, nice rest of the evening, um, and see you maybe in the next event.